Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we live like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. Uh, we've been in the book of Isaiah. Today we're in chapter 9. Um, we've been talking about the Assyrian Empire, um, what it was like, um, what the threat to oh. Israel was, and Isaiah's response to it, which as we said before, it didn't seem very intuitive. For unto us a child is born, uh, the virgin shall conceive. What does that have to do with the invading hordes? But we're going to get into it some more today. You know, as, as Christians in the 21st century, we see, ah, spoilers, I know why the child is important, because Honda's going to write an oratorio about him. So saith all the music history majors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If If... If you have a certain experience, you have a song stuck in your head right now. Mm -hmm. But that song came from Isaiah chapter 9. So let's pick up there. Right? Well, as you say, we've been talking about Isaiah for a while. And we'll continue because Isaiah is a really long book. And a lot of it does just simply hold together, despite liberal claims that there were two or three Isaiahs writing at different times. What we've seen is what I've called Isaiah's Christmas sermon, because when pastors go to preach Christmas sermons, there's a really good chance if they're not in the New Testament, they're in Isaiah. And in these chapters, the background, as you said, is uh, imminent Assyrian invasion, and, and even more imminent, the possible invasion from uh, the northern kingdom, Israel, and its neighbor, Syria into Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, King Ahaz of Judah is not interested in God's solutions. He uh, concocts his own uh, political solution of an alliance with Assyria. And Which, uh, if you know anything about Old Testament history, is a very bad thing. Yeah, that, yeah that's, it's, it's, it, that's dumb. <laughs> but he thinks he's brilliant for coming off with this. Uh, and God sends Isaiah. He doesn't go and look for Isaiah. God sends Isaiah, the prophet, to say, um, that's not how I'm going to solve this. And if you'd like, in order to, to be encouraged, you can ask any sign you want. You can ask for a sign in the heaven, a sign in the earth. But Ahaz is already dead set on his political solution to things and says, I will not ask, nor neither will I tempt the Lord my God. And Isaiah says, fine, or something like that. Uh, is it a small thing, O house of David, for you to worry men? But will you worry my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And the nature of the sign is indeed a virgin birth, not the birth of an ordinary child from an ordinary young woman, as uh, the gospel writers make very clear. Matthew and Luke both make it clear that that's when, when Isaiah said that, they were talking about the birth of our Lord Jesus, that he was, in, that she, he was indeed born of a virgin, that is a woman who had not had sexual relations with a man, just in case we're not sure what the word virgin means anymore. But but the, the critics, both the liberal critics and often even conservatives say, but that doesn't seem to fit, because how does that, as Emily said, how does that answer the immediate military problem or political problem of First, this conspiracy of nations to the north, and beyond that, the Assyrian war machine that's about to roll over everybody. Doesn't 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 seem like that's really a useful answer. Uh, and and we continue into the twenty first century, oftentimes not understanding the relevance of God's answers, of God's plans, of God's signs, because we have too small, too narrow of a focus when we look for how how things could be fixed. Uh, I have this, this huge financial problem. Obviously, God should give me a sign by dropping a few million dollars in a Swiss bank account in my name. I'm waiting for that kind of <laughs> sign. God's not going to do that. Well, well, that's not helpful then. I, I don't know what God's up to, but I'm, I'm going to wait for that. No, that's not generally how God... I mean, he could, but that's I mean, not generally how he does things. God's not like that. We misunderstand God. Ahaz misunderstood God, Judah misunderstood God, Israel misunderstood God, Assyria misunderstood God. Uh, God's ways are not our ways, and the works of the flesh, the normal 
methods whereby human beings solve problems without reference to God, without trusting God, without falling back on God's perspective of what's important, all of that usually fails a lot. And even when it succeeds, it may not succeed the way we think it's succeeding. So uh, what Isaiah says to Ahaz, in effect is, uh, you're getting cocky, you're the house of David and all that, you're in the line of kings that supposedly leads to Messiah. So you think you basically have God in a bind here. You can ignore God because God's bound by his covenant promises to use you to maintain your dynasty and all that. And so you can play both sides of the street. You can go seek your political solutions, but you know that God's going to be forced to back you up at the end, uh, mm. if God's there be. And, and Isaiah's message, God's message is, forget you, don't need you. We, we God, the triune God, can bring this Messiah, the Savior, into the world without reference to the house of David, at least as they think of such things. A virgin, uh, mm. a woman untouched by a man, is going to give birth to a child who will be God with us. And God's people stared at that and marveled at that for another 500 years or so, trying to figure out, what does that mean? I mean, God's with us, his promises, his word. What's so special about this child? What, what and who could he possibly be that <laughs> makes his coming into the world such a big deal? And granted, all right, so God doesn't need the house of David. But really, how does that, that just makes things worse. If God doesn't need the house of David, we're all toast, because that was our one card left. God will always <laughs> protect us, because God needs us. Oh, he doesn't need us. Well, basically, we're screwed then. Uh, it, well, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like the kind of hope that God's people needed right then. And what's so interesting, too, is it just fits the broader uh, pattern in Scripture of God providing the way out mm -hmm. of being the one to work power that saves and i mean obviously we see that in we're all calvinists here um <laughs> in soteriology but um constantly throughout all the different issues that have faced god's people and their covenant heads some of it was was accomplished through them doing actions but there's an awful lot of it where the battle is the lord's you can think of um oh my bible trivia just failed me uh, <laughs> well moses and israel at the red sea stand still and see the salvation of the lord moses but it's also uh, true that when when the people had to act in faith that was God saying, do this, and then you'll see that the battle is mine. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not like you know, it off, was really off, riding on them. You know, oftentimes when God did require his people to do something, it wasn't the obviously sane thing to do. Um, Gideon yeah. was who I was thinking of. Yeah, Gideon, exactly. The, is a great example. Yeah, get rid of most of your army. <laughs> yeah, and and get grab a torch and a pitcher and a trumpet oh. and um, watch what's going to happen here. Uh, and, and we can track this all the way. I mean, we could track it through Hebrews 11, honestly. Oh, yeah. All of, um, of the Hebrews of the faith. But again and again, well, two, two things here. God comes up with amazing, powerful solutions that glorify him and that rarely leave any room for glory upon the part of the human instrument. Two, what God's people accomplish or what God accomplishes for them Often is not what God's people want. God's people want, say, let's see the world converted. I'm going to destroy it with a flood. Oh, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> um, let's let's march out through some easy path out of uh, out of Egypt. We're going through a sea, and it's just sitting there laughing at us. That's not good. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a king. He's a little boy. <laughs> All right, how about uh, the little boy's going to take on a giant? Let's give him some heavy weapons. He's using a slingshot. <clears throat> and, and so we go. God's always doing something strange, and yet the solutions, uh, and, and, and perhaps they're, they're, aside from the flood itself, perhaps, 
there, there's, I think, maybe not another time in Scripture where the solution seems so absolutely like not the solution. Basically, God is saying, you're all going into captivity. That's my great plan. <laughs> Israel's already on its way out. Judah's going to join them in a short time. The land's going to be desolate. The Davidic kingdom is falling apart. It's not going to be revived anytime soon. You're going to be slaves to a foreign power, uh, but you'll be alive. There's my solution. What do you think of that? Lord, <laughs> that's, that's not exactly a solution from our point of view. Oh, it's great. You're going to love this. Uh, huh. Just you wait. And when uh, you, you're both familiar, I hope our listeners are, with the uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, and, and then again in Daniel 7, with the various animals followed by the one who comes in glory. In, in each case, as they looked at that and said, oh, here's God's plan for history. Okay, there's going to be this, this really powerful, glorious kingdom, followed by a slightly less glorious kingdom, which isn't God's or Israel's or anybody's, followed by another kingdom, which, um, yeah, isn't really God's or Israel's or anybody's, followed by this really mean, nasty kingdom that's going to stamp on everything and, and just be like a bar of iron crushing everybody. And this is going to take 490 years. See, our plan was different here. Um, we weren't going to go into captivity. Uh, the the God is going to send angels and turn back all of the armies, like he he does at one point. He destroys the Assyrian army, and then he's going to exalt us and lay down our enemies. And we're going to have this great kingdom, and we're going to rule the world, and it'll be cool. And no, that no captivity is really what you guys need. It's going to be the best solution all around for what I need done. And you're going to have to trust me on this one. And you're going to have to keep on trusting me for nearly 500 years. But when that's done, it's still not going to be the solution you think it is. But trust me, because it's going to be a lot better if you have faith to believe. And somehow a baby in a manger wasn't exactly what they had in mind, let alone a man on a cross. Uh, and so as we do read through Isaiah, we are con con constantly hit in the face with this, here's the plan, it's not what you thought. Here's the victory, it doesn't look like the victory you had in mind. Here's the solution, it's not political or military. Here's the kingdom, it's not about lording it over Gentile nations. It's all different, and although we, we I keep saying we, but the prophet speaking for the Lord, uh, God does not need any of this, you're going to have the honor of being a vessel that God's going to use in the midst of it anyhow. At least a remnant of you will be. The faithful. God's going to bring through all this. He's going to take you out of the land. He's going to take care of you when you're out of the land. He's going to bring you back into the land. He's going to take care of you while you're in the land. In fact, those very pagan powers that look so scary, they're the ones who are going to oversee things and build you roads and and offer military protection and courts and all that. And yeah, you're going to be kind of a poor, no-account nation, but you'll be here right on time when Messiah comes. This is Psalm 8, right? Talking about the the majesty of God and then zooming in and focusing on the child. Yes. <laughs> out of the mouths of infants. Out There's the such mouth. an irony in that, that God delights in. Out of the mouths in. of babes and sucklings. Yeah, throughout this Christmas sermon, uh, we keep coming back to the idea of a child. Sometimes the child is explicitly Jesus. Sometimes it's just, he just talks about children. <laughs> uh, a little child shall lead them. I, I, the reference isn't exactly to Jesus, and yet there's some parallels to be sure. So anyway, that's that's chapter seven. Um, God is going to dispense with the, the kingdoms that are a threat, Syria and Israel. But yeah, Syria is coming. And uh, God's okay with this. And Assyria is going to thrash you really good. Assyria is going to be like an axe chopping things down left and right. Uh, and your, your world will become darkness. In fact, chapter 8 ends with this. Uh, they shall pass through it hardly bestead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God, and look upward, and they shall look into the earth, and behold, trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Nevertheless, chapter 9 begins. 
The dimness shall not be as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. It's referring to the early Syrian invasions when the Syrian armies came in and began to depopulate those regions, but didn't completely overwhelm them. So the affliction was relatively light, except, of course, for the people who went captive or, or died. And afterwards did more grievously afflict her by the way of a sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. And that's one of the first times that the name of Galilee pops up. Why Galilee in the midst of all this? Oh, why? Because the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. So the very place where the Assyrian armies are going to begin their work and do the worst of their work, northern Israel, they're going to take that, na that whole nation, all those ten tribes captive, one day that's where the light's going to pop up. And Matthew, in his gospel, picks this up and says, this is about Jesus preaching. Mm -hmm. Not in Judea, not in Jerusalem, but in Galilee, which bordered on the Gentile territories, Galilee of the nations. Uh, of course, his disciples, many of them came, from, well, they all except Judas apparently came from Galilee. Many of them fished on that lake, that sea. And it's in this context then, well, let me read what follows. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppression, as in the days of Midian. That's a reference to Gideon. And every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fire for... So... There's going to be battle, there's going to be war, and yet in the midst of this, God's got their back, as he did in the day of Midian. He's going to it's break... It's so interesting yeah. that it's called the day of Midian, because yeah. usually we talk about the day of somebody as the victor. Yeah. And <laughs> that was, if we were going by that, it would be the day of the Lord, but then every day would be the day, the day of the Lord. Lord. <laughs> there would be no distinguishing. Well, you know, sometimes we cower uh, in the shadow of the one that lost. We still mm -hmm. speak with a little bit of trepidation of the former Soviet Union and the mm -hmm. collapse of the wall. We look back at World War II, and we don't speak so much of uh, VE Day. We speak of the Nazi hordes of Adolf Hitler, even children who don't remember it anymore, at least they've seen Marvel movies and they, and, and they know that at that point, Hydra was trying to take over the world, <laughs> you know, because it's that background works. And so it's easy to look back and see the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And so God picks the name of the bad guys here and says, yeah, that, that day, th in other words, think about it. What happened when Midian was a threat? What happened when Nazi Germany was a threat? What happened when the Soviet Union seemed unstoppable? God did some things that no one expected. Now, I don't know about you. You're, you're, I imagine, how old were you when, when the Berlin Wall fell? I wasn't born yet. You weren't yeah. born yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I grew up in the shadow of that. Now, obviously, I didn't live at the end of World War II. I didn't hear Churchill say, a great iron curtain is coming down upon Europe. But I grew up with that as an established fact, and for my generation, it was an established fact. The Soviet Union has those satellite nations firmly under its control, controls East Germany, controls East Berlin, and it will always be that way. We could not imagine anything short of an incredible war that probably would not go very well for anybody that would ever change that. And then one day to be sitting up late at night watching television, uh, television cameras in in. East Berlin or West Berlin, since they were right on the wall, and seeing people just climb up on the wall and no one was shooting them. And then seeing people kind of jump over the wall or climb back both ways over the wall and and see uh, East uh, German soldiers standing there, not sure what to do, and, and West Germans coming up and hugging them. Like, what in the world is going on here? This is not... And then we started hearing about the revolutions in Romania. And then all over the satellite countries, what is, this is not how this works. God would have notified us. I mean, 
this we were on the road, most of the church would have said we're on the road to World War Three. Uh, we've 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 got the Soviet Union. It's going to move on to Israel. Um, then the rapture. Somewhere in there comes the rapture and and the final and Armageddon. And yeah, this this is it. And even those of us who didn't buy into dispensational theology, myth, mythology, yes, eschatology, uh, still pretty much could not ab- imagine a world where this wasn't the way things were. Mm-hmm. And when it fell apart, it wasn't nuclear war. It wasn't any of the things that normally prove a great challenge to to great empires. I mean, there wasn't an assassination plot to bring down the leader and all that. The leader simply cowered and backed down again and again, not knowing what in the world to do. As various peoples and various nations finally said, we're tired of this. We say it's over. And the West rejoiced, but with a great deal of confusion. God rescued his church from the control of the Soviet empire. And we had the United States had very little to do with it, only in a very indirect sense. And even God's people in the West did not have nearly as much to do with it as we should have. It wasn't that we were there holding all night vigils praying for the collapse of the Berlin Wall. We just kind of stood there awestruck saying, what? If there's a lesson here for us, I, I think that at least part of it is that. One, God has not abandoned history. Two, but what God's going to do with history isn't what you think. <laughs> it's not what you plan. It's not how you would do it. I'll, I'll give you another example. I had one young one gentleman come up to me just before uh, the last election, when things j- just before things were questionable, saying, "I, I know, I, I, I have this assurance from the Lord that." Uh, Donald Trump is God's anointed man. He's going to see us through this. God's going to raise him up. God's going to give him the victory in the election. And everything's going to turn around. I'm, I'm sure that this is what God has planned. By the way, for YouTube's sake, that was the safest, most secure election in American history. Of course it was. Nobody could possibly have tampered with that election. And so, Isaiah, this is not what you think it is. You're looking for... God to make your life comfortable and easy by some kind of big wow kind of solution that will turn the world upside down and will require very little of you, except maybe some applause and a few bows at the end. And that's not it. Judah is doomed. Judah is going into captivity. The captivity will be long, as Jeremiah says, a full generation, 70 years and more, before God's people will be back. And they will never come back to an independent kingdom truly again. There will always be powers about them to whom they have to kowtow. There will always be other forces, and even their own leaders will not always be particularly godly. In fact, they'll get worse and worse as we move on. So where's the hope in all of this? Well, the next verse, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Child! Most of the prophecies of Messiah focus upon the Messiah and his maturity, and sometimes upon his glory and sometimes upon his suffering. But a very few point out that he will be a human, and he'll be marked as a human because he will be born into this sinful, cursed world and become one of us, God with us, Emmanuel, born of a virgin, and from there he will grow up And so this is not going to be instantaneous. The baby himself, as a baby, is not going to coo and and peep and change the world. He's going to grow up, (laughs) and he's going to have a life, and he's going to do things. And the other, Isaiah himself later will tell us some of what he will do, and it mostly is kind of scary because it's mostly suffering, ending in death. And that somehow, through that, he's going to change everything. See, because the first thing you have to understand is that man's problem is not that there are scary empires and uh, devious conspiracies and technology that can destroy us all and nuclear weapons that can blow up the planet. None of those are the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is our own sin. It's kind of a sidelight, but interesting today. I ask my students, where does sin come from? And they all said, well, the heart of man. I said, whose heart would that be? <laughs> and they Man went, out uh, there, somebody uh, else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it took them a while to some, some say, our heart. Uh-huh. 
Can Power. we be a little more specific? Mm-hmm. Oh, my heart. Yeah. That's hard. That's hard. <laughs> That's hard. And then what follows is, and God is angry with the wicked every day. It's not the Armenian gospel. If God loves everybody, he's trying to save everybody. He really would if he could, but you know, he's limited by our free will choices. And so we don't know where this is going. It's going to be a bumpy ride. It's probably going to Armageddon in the rapture. But God really means us well, and he would help us if he could. Not that God. The God who punishes sin, who punishes it either in the lake of fire or who punished it in his son. And therefore, the most important thing to happen in history with regard to man's problem is the death of this child. This child came into the world to die. Now, the story doesn't end there, but without that, the rest of the story doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't even happen. He came to die. And and so, but why a child, why does this why is this child so important? Then you've already said he's a manual God with us. We're not we're not sure what that means. He's virgin born. Okay, I guess that's that's really miraculous and kind of weird. The child is born. The son is given. Is there something in that? Why did you say that twice? The government shall be upon his shoulder. All right. So yeah, he's going to be a ruler. We 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 figured that. House of David and all, and his name shall be called wonderful. A lot of modern translations, um, and, and it, it's not a translation issue in the sense of looking at the text. It's a translation issue in terms of figuring out what Isaiah and what God actually meant. A lot rendered as wonderful counselor because it keeps the adjective noun thing that, that, that seems to predominate. But the thing is, wonderful is a word we've seen before. When the angel appeared to uh, Samson's parents, mm-hmm. he said, what is your name that we may do you honor? He responded. Why do you ask after my name, seeing it is wonderful? King James says secret. But the Greek text says, or the Hebrew text says, my name is wonderful. And then we're told, and the angel whose name is wonderful did wondrously by stepping into the flame on the altar and descending in it. He became the sacrifice. He identified himself with the sacrifice. So when God says wonderful, yes, a wonderful savior who is a wonderful God, who does wondrous things, him, counselor. Isaiah is full of references to how God alone is the one who has solutions. Hmm. Um, he did not ask counsel of anybody else. He doesn't need anybody's advice. There, were, there was no one kibitzing with him when he created the world or when he planned salvation. He's got it all figured out. His wisdom is infinite. We're left in the dust with it. The mighty God. Well, there you go. <laughs> At which point Jehovah's Witnesses backpedal and say, well, that's because Jesus is a God. Wait, I thought you were monotheist. Now you got a couple of gods going on. Are there more? Maybe three, four, five. How many gods are you? But this is a phrase that's used elsewhere in scripture for Jehovah, for Yahweh. Yahweh is called the mighty God. And so in calling him this, it, it, to those who are listening and paying attention, what makes this child so important? This child is God. Oh, so when you said God with us, you meant it literally. Uh Uh-huh. Oh. Well, that kind of turns the world upside down, doesn't it? The everlasting Father, the Hebrew says, the Father of eternity. Here is an eternal being, i.e. God, who is from everlasting to everlasting, who transcends time. Again, Yes, it's a child that's born, and yet he is eternal, beyond the constraints of time and space and matter. He's sovereign. He is the prince of peace. You're talking about peace. He's the prince, the author, the ruler of peace. But all you're talking about is war. That's because you're looking at the wrong thing. If you're looking at the immediate political political effects of Jesus coming in the world, well, let's see. Destruction of Jerusalem, death of Nero, repeated assassinations and deaths violently of emperors, persecution of the church. Yeah, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. If you look at that, it takes a much longer viewpoint to see what God's all about. And that's what the text immediately calls us to. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. He's coming as a child, a divine child, God come in the flesh, God with us. But 
his work has a beginning that seems relatively small, maybe insignificant, but it will grow and grow and grow. And here again, think of the prophecy of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where the stone smites the the image of the pagan kingdoms and then grows to fill the whole world. It's not an instantaneous, this is not a premillennial victory where Jesus is suddenly there and suddenly the whole world's converted or subdued or whatever. This is a progressive thing. And when we get to the New Testament and we see Jesus saying, go and make disciples of all nations and see him ascend to heaven, and the angel saying, he's not going to be back for a little while. Oh, this was the, it takes a while thing? It starts small? Like, didn't our master say like leaven or a mustard seed? Yeah, that. Oh, so we should go get to work. Yeah, go 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 do that. That's yeah, do that. Most of us, I think, if we saw Jesus ascend, would do what the disciples did initially: just stare at the sky. He's coming back, right? Yes, but not as soon as you think. <laughs> it, it, it might take a while. You know, you mean like a few months? Um. Like you might be dead. At least <laughs> you might. Yeah, you might be dead. I was uh, some while back. I was talking to a young a young woman who, um, for whom I have a great deal of affection and respect. But she she had grown up in this dispensational mindset, and um, she was focused on the idea that Jesus was coming back soon. And I said, "Well, you mean his coming? He he can come back when he pleases. He can come back any time. Yes, that's what I mean." So that means he's coming back soon. No. <laughs> Anytime does not mean soon. Yes, it does, doesn't it? No. Anytime <laughs> is literally any time, which could be right now. Hmm. Or later. Or a thousand years or 10,000 years. What? I remember being 38 weeks pregnant and thinking, oh, any time now. Yeah. And then it was not in the 38th week. It was, yeah. <laughs> Anytime... <laughs> Uh, who's measuring the time here? Who's setting the parameters? Who's setting the goalposts? Well, it's been 2,000 years so far. And Jesus' kingdom continues to grow. But as in the days of Isaiah, it doesn't grow the way we in our fleshly attitudes would like it to. I mean, most of us are, are, are probably good enough to not want, oh, laser blast from heaven knocking down all of the strongholds of wickedness, but we'd at least like to see some major revivals sweeping the country and hordes of people swarming into churches and um, heretics being kicked out of churches and out of seminaries and out of Christian radio ministries and television ministries and, and really godly people standing up and, and preaching and, and everyone rushing to go to church on Sundays. Can't we have that at least? Well, not yet. There have been times in Earth's history where God has done that, little brief times, and probably there will be times like that again. But in the meantime, Jesus has done a lot of smashing of nations. Mm -hmm. and, and, he, and here again is the, the inverse understanding. People will look back at the 20th century and say, World War I, well, Balkan Wars, World War I, World War II, Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, all the, the Persian Gulf Wars, all of that, they say, that one just blends into another. Where is Jesus Christ? Where's the kingdom of God? See, it's all, it all failed. We're losing. This is the end. That's the wrong perspective. Just as Israel should not have said when they saw the Assyrians coming over the hill, oh, God failed us. They should have said, oh, this is exactly what God has said. It is chastisement for our sins and the opening up of new possibilities that we had not foreseen. It is God getting rid of idolatrous Syria and apostate Israel while he punishes for our sins. And he's escorting us to a place where we won't be all that terribly comfortable, but we'll be safe until he's ready for the next move. Because that's what he said, because we've read the book <laughs> and we believe it. And, and, and so we, we need a major readjustment of what victory looks like. Uh, we, we use semi-technical terms like post-millennial, amillennial, pre-millennial. I really am not liking those terms a whole lot, mm -hmm. often because we misunderstand each other. Yeah. Post-millennial, that means you're utopian where you think everything's going to get better real fast and there's going to be peace and joy throughout the world any day now. No, that's not also what that- Also stone the adulterers. Yeah. Plus, yeah, plus we're going to, yeah, once we stone the adulterers and all the homosexuals, then, then it'll be so much- No, that is not remotely what we're talking about. 
one writer coined the term preppy postmillennialism. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if that's what you're talking about, well, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. Preppy as in like you wear button down shirts or preppy <laughs> as in like I have a stock load of food in my No, I, th I, th I think it was the first. I think it meant oh, okay. uh, a, a victory, a victory that you can get simply by reading books and watching YouTube videos mm -hmm. and never really having to do much that's going to cause you to sweat or stain your clothes. Mm -hmm. That kind yeah. of preppiness. Gotcha. Um and as a small child or a young teenager, that's probably where I was because all I heard was victory, victory, victory. But the older I get and the more I read scripture, the more I understand that and that God's kingdom hastens to the darkness. One of my favorite songs, as you perhaps know, is God the All Terrible. Well, first of all, there you go with the title. Um, our, Talk about our, needing, needing to define terms. Right? Yeah. The, um, our church pianist who, who conducts the... Uh, children's choir, was having each of the elders come in and share with them the elder's favorite song, mm -hmm. explaining why he liked said song. And I wasn't thrilled to do this because I'm not great with small children, but okay, if that's what you want, God the All Terrible. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, God, God the All Terrible. Could, it's in your hymn, no. <laughs> yeah, well, she knew it. Can you come yeah. in and explain to the children what those words mean and why that's your favorite? I don't remember what I said, and I don't know if the kids understood it, but I tried to be really simple. But one of the, aside from the fact that it's, it's the words are set to something called Russian hymn, which <laughs> just by itself, it's, you know, really cool. It's like Austrian hymn. Um, <laughs> what is that? Um, Glory Sings of a Year Spoken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, there's, there's the line, through the thick darkness, thy kingdom is hastening. That. You look at World War One and World War Two, and you say, "How is that the kingdom of God? It left Europe in shambles. It killed so many people. It left half of Europe enslaved to the Soviet Empire to communism. And at the same time, in the United States, we went from being something kind of like a republic to being a socialist oligarchy under the New Deal. Mm -hmm. Where were the victories here? Well." I don't know, have all the answers, but I know that nations who had apostatized, who laughed at God, who ignored him, thumbed their noses at him, suddenly felt the full weight of his wrath. I know that an underground church has prospered, despite the persecution, with a true faith that was better than that of the established Orthodox churches that were in bed with the state. Uh, I know that the West, churches in the West were roused to work with the underground churches and and realize that there are people here who are suffering for Christ and tried to help uh, and, and and so you can you can go through these things and and see the hand of God in retrospect but it's it's not how we would have done it it's not how we would have written the story because God would got, would draw glory to himself and he's not in a hurry I remember hearing, I think it was a Lutheran pastor talking about God's providence and the hard providences yes. of God has put himself there, but that's not where he's put himself to be found. Um, where he's put himself to be found is on the cross right. and in his word. We can try to read God's mind, but really he spelled it out for us with the things we really need to know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we are pointed at this child of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with justice and with judgment from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So God does have an agenda. It involves peace, peace, first of all, between God and men. But lest we, we, we make light of that and say, well, that means a few people are going to be saved. That's not really what he's saying. It's peace between God and the world. God loved the world in such a way that he gave his son. God gave his son that the world through, might, through him might be saved. We confess that this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Over and over again in the New Testament, it is very clear that God's goals are not slight. He is not satisfied mm -hmm. with just getting a few people here and there and that that counts somehow. But he is slow by our standards. Mm -hmm. And we have to wait a lot. The kingdom 
continues to increase. His power increasing still shall spread. His ray no inch shall no justice shall guard his throne above and peace about below. Wonderful Christmas song. But it upsets all of our sociological, political, and military notions and simple, selfish notions of what victory is going to look like, of what God's really up to. And we're going to continue in Isaiah, and we're going to see that this really doesn't change. In fact, we're going to find out that this wonderful child, who we praise so highly here, is going to die a most miserable death. And while the explanations are there, as we read through it in our haste and in our fears and our misunderstanding, we may miss them. And we may, as the Jews did, who is this person the prophet speaks of? Which is exactly the question the Ethiopian eunuch has. Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? This person who's going to suffer so much? Well, we have to get to the New Testament. And eventually, maybe Lord willing in this podcast, we will. <laughs> but in the meantime, we walk by faith. We say, yeah, God, God knew all along. When we get to the when we get to the prophet side events, we look back and say, Wow, look, God had it all planned. We knew all this all along. 2020 hindsight. <laughs> yeah. How at the I end of the mystery it? story, looking yeah, back well, at all the clues. Yeah, I saw that coming. No, nobody saw that coming. And looking back, we still often misunderstand. And and traditional dis classic dispensationalism, which is not not many people hold anymore, praise God, basically said God's plan failed. The Jews rejected their Messiah, and so God had to come up with Plan B. That's the cross, and that's temporary, and that's not going to succeed very well. And then one day God will go back and try pick up that other plan, and the solution will be Jesus coming back and, and reigning by military, political, divine force from Jerusalem, because that's the solution that we can understand, and that must be what God has in mind. And this, this gospel thing of winning souls one at a time, hey, we've been at it for 2,000 years, and not much has happened. Obviously, this failed. <laughs> <All right>. Or... <laughs> Maybe all of our parameters of judgment are way off because we so easily fall into the standards that our own flesh sets for how God ought to do things. Have you considered that your scope is too narrow? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. indeed. Oh, well, America's fallen. Hope is lost for the world. It's like alien invasion movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, they took DC. The world it's is over. lost. <laughs> Yeah, the only reason they say that is because they're in Hollywood and they think the only places that exist are Hollywood and DC. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> pr pr pretty much. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Hollywood, DC, should... and Texas. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Texas is where the hillbillies live. Mm. Yeah. You know, right, when, well, it, when, when Independence Day came out, you remember the movie? Yeah. Which you get Alien Invasion. Mm -hmm. I what, didn't know this at movie? the time, but I should have figured it out. A lot of other nations complained afterwards that this was American centric. Because, because it absolutely is. Because it absolutely was. It took America <laughs> to chase the aliens out. What movie is this? Independence, Independence Day. Day. Oh, Independence Day. Yes. Yeah. 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 But I, you know, and that's it's also good interesting Americans. because the whole point is that they brought all the other nations together as well, and they all had to do stuff in their parts of the world too. It's like, did you watch the movie? <laughs> Yeah. Also, but, like, to but be we're honest, the ones who figured it out, and we had the compatible laptop. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, Everyone, though, like, look at World War II <laughs> and tell me you can tell that story without being American centric. <laughs> like, uh, I'm a big I mean, Winston British, Churchill fan, but their, he needed some help. <laughs> the, the Brits give it a good try at making it uh, England centric, yeah. but yeah, and and somewhat to be fair, the whole story is a little bit. Uh, centered around Germany. So, yeah. couldn't have happened without them. Uh, give it up. And, and Japan. Yeah. And you yeah. know what's between Germany and Japan? United States. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> we should wrap up and have some recommendations. Okay. All right. Well, I will begin, I guess, since Brian just left the room. Uh, <laughs> Where did he go? I probably to find something. Okay. Um, I, uh, in Bible study, uh, I've been, I started teaching the Gospel of John only to find out that the commentaries I have are mostly horrible. Uh, and so, not having a lot of uh, expendable money, I, I settled on one commentary that got high praise, and I, I, I know the author from other things he's done. So, I bought it. It was, it was a hefty expenditure, but, but I found a relatively cheaper version of it. 
Uh, the author is William Hendrickson, and of course, the title is Commentary on the Gospel of John. And it was such a breath of fresh air after reading all these liberal commentaries, that, <laughs> and even the conservative ones who who count down to the liberals left and right. Well, the liberals say this, and I'm sure they mean well, and they have a lot of evidence on their side, but maybe it wasn't that way. Maybe it was, you know, maybe John wasn't written in 100 AD. Maybe it was more like 90 AD, when John was really old, and mostly remembered accurately, you know, this is horrible reading from one commentary to another. <laughs> Along comes William Hendrickson and just says, yeah, the liberals are a bunch of uh, heretics and liars. So we'll just <laughs> leave them behind now. <laughs> uh, but if you want to know the answers to what they're saying, it's this, 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 this is about four pages of boom, 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 boom. No long wrestlings with the soul. No mm. long, no fear of being rejected as a scholar because you're not on the right page. It's just... He just walks through it, and then he comes to the text, and his is one of the most marvelous, theologically insightful, and yet devotionally open commentaries I've ever seen. Now, I've only read the first couple chapters, so there's there's more, I, I, but I know the man by his other work, godly man, conservative, evangelical, reformed in the Dutch tradition, and... Uh, it, it is, it's It's a thick book, but normally it comes in two, at least two volumes. I got a single volume and the print is not super tiny. So you can get it and get it used. And if you, and, and there, there, there's scholarly stuff along the way, but he nicely puts it out of the way. In fact, he says up front, mm. I want this to be something everyone can use. Mm. And I don't want the scholarly okay. stuff in the way that it scares people off. So I'm going to put it over here in the corner. If you're interested, you can look at it, but you can just follow the main argument otherwise. And uh, the goal is to speak to the common believer. So William Hendrickson, the Gospel of John, he also wrote um, commentaries on most of the New Testament, and I've found them all to be excellent. Great. Um, I'm going to recommend auditing classes. Hmm. I am just about to start one on the Church of England and the Anglican Communion since the Ooh. Reformation. I who's, don't, who's offering it? Um, it's through Davenant Hall. Davenant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reese Laverty is what head of it? Or Brad Littlejohn is head of it? I don't know. Brad Littlejohn's the head, or at least the founder. Mm -hmm. I don't recognize the name Reese, uh, oh. whatever his last name was, you said. But I, I interact with a lot of the people who are authors for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're a, a really solid group. Mm hmm. Good, good. Yeah. So I was talking with uh, my friend Virginia, who was an early guest on this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and she's like, yeah, I've been auditing classes. And I was like, oh, that's cool. With the college near where you live? And she's like, no, with these people. And I'm like, well, that's fun. Can I take a <laughs> class with you? Um, so yeah, she's Anglican. Hence the interest in the Anglicanism mm -hmm. class. Um, I'm, I might be the only non-Anglican in there. We'll see. But um, it's a really affordable way to um, scratch some scholarly itches without committing to huge expenditures or a scheduled degree. Um, so I take it there is a fee of some sort? There is. Um, this one was with the book that I'll need for the class. <clears throat> it came to about $260. Mm -hmm. Still not bad. Not bad for... No, a for a university level, level yeah. kind of education, not at all. Right. So, of course, I don't get any sort of brownie points for it, but mm -hmm. it's, I'm looking forward to it being a nice introduction to Davenant as an as a school as well. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So that if I did want to pursue a degree from them, I and would I, know what I was getting Where is Davenant into. headquartered or existing uh, in real space? I think it's headquartered in New England right now because mm -hmm. I – or maybe it's Florida. I know that Brad <laughs> moved to New England from uh -huh. somewhere. Yeah. But it's chiefly like, online. It's like a publication. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the authors live all over. Well, they have a publication. They're also this sort of seminary thing, and they're also a website. So. Yeah. Okay. yeah. They, they, had, they just had like a... Um, in-person week oh, of yeah, like a summit classes kind of and something. And I, I believe that was in Florida. Mm -hmm. Oh, I... Thought it was Virginia. Maybe oh, it was Virginia. It was yes, near sorry, my friend Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, yes, Virginia. Yeah, they'll, they'll do in-person stuff, and I remember seeing pictures of it somewhere, and it was like 
it just looked like someone's house. It was great. <laughs> yeah. like 12 people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Brian, that leaves you. Um, I I have two, I think. The first one is very whimsical. Uh, it is not serious at all. We had a guest come over and, and spend some time with us yesterday. And towards the end, we were like, you know what? We don't want the night to end, but we don't want the night to go on too much longer. Mm-hmm. Let's find something short to watch on, you know, Amazon Prime. Right. And we found a documentary from 2017 about the Mothman of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <What? laughs> the what it is now? The Mothman. The Mothman. <laughs> I don't know. It's a cryptid. What? Why do you all know about this? Because <laughs> we run in the right circles. <laughs> Anyway, it basically in the late 60s there were uh, a bunch of sightings in this little town that borders uh the the Ohio River between Ohio and West Virginia mm-hmm. uh called Point Pleasant. And a bunch of people in Point Pleasant reported seeing a giant bird-like humanoid creature in the forest and it was like flying above their cars and and all this stuff and what's funny is every single description said it was like a big bird and somehow they all still named it mothman (laughs) so we watched that and this this the particular one we watched is called the mothman of point pleasant mothman is one word um right it is the most all over the place documentary I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it it's written like it was written by the Mothman, you know, just different lights getting distracted by them. Um, anyway, so that was that's the whimsical one. It was it was very funny. It's on um, it's on Prime for free. So if you have Amazon Prime, it's not going to cost you anything. But if you don't, it's, I think it's two dollars. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. Two dollars to rent. Don't rent it. Just don't. It's not worth that. But if it's free, you should watch it. So that's the the whimsical one. the The more serious recommendation is, I just I I've been reading a lot more books in the past several months. I I well, you guys can see now. That's my book. Oh, you know. it's, it's it's about the length of my forearm. Yeah, and a cubit, a cubit as high. it were. A cubit, as it were. I am at present just about thirty pages shy of finishing the one that's on my desk right now uh which is about uh vietnam fittingly enough Mm. since you mentioned it um particularly my lie which is Mm. not a fun kind of detail to read Mm -hmm. through but the one i read before that was also really good uh mark knoll's civil war as theological crisis Mm. very Very good. good yeah it it does it doesn't really have like the narrative arc that I was expecting it yeah. to uh, have. No. <laughs> it's it's not more just like, no. here's an opinion, here's the other side. Right. And it's more like a spreadsheet than a story. <laughs> it is. You're right. It is. Yeah. I, it's like when I read through it, I was just like, all right, I can just see the Excel columns yeah. filling mm-hmm. up, you know? Yep. <laughs> but uh, it's that very was really organized. Good. <laughs> That's why it works. <laughs> it's incredibly organized. <laughs> he he kind of goes through, it's just like um, antebellum opinions mm-hmm. on uh, slavery. From the North, pro-slavery, mm-hmm. the North, anti-slavery, the South, pro-slavery, and the mm-hmm. rare South, uh, anti-slavery. Mm-hmm. And I think at some point he also goes into um, the opinions of uh, uh, contemporary Europeans mm-hmm. on American slavery in particular. It's very, very interesting. But the mm-hmm. whole the whole point was just to show that you know the, the Civil War wasn't just political. It was about both sides being very strongly people of the book. Yes. Of of the scripture and coming to different conclusions based on any number of factors you could name. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's Location, really denominational training, that sort of thing. It's really yeah. interesting. And interestingly enough as well, uh something I noticed in my read through of it that I was like, wow, that sounds familiar, was that people who came down on one side were criticized by the other side. Because the people on the one side had also had people who held to that that view that went liberal in, mm-hmm. in the theological mm-hmm. sense of the term. Yeah, your position and leads to liberal theology. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Even though they were like, look, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, they were talking about uh, the opinion of Protestants abroad and how um, 
generally speaking in in Europe, the kind of general focus of Protestantism on being anti-Catholic mm-hmm. against Rome still maintained its priority, but in America it became okay, what side of the slavery debate are you on? That was the new kind of primary marker of your theological affinity. Mm. And he he says, by temporarily displacing historical anti-Catholicism, American Protestants may have worked a subtle theological alteration in which Christian sanction or censure of a currently vexing American problem took precedence over a traditional theological agenda where anti-Romanism was the key to religious self-identity. If so, the war was modernizing American Protestantism by shaking it loose from history and substituting contemporary interests as stronger reference points for theological alignment. Oh, wow. There is a lot of application (laughs) to what happens for the next hundred years or so. Yeah. Yes. It just, I remember I read that and I was like, I was I was skimming through it at that point because I was like coming up on my my interlibrary loan um, return date and I was like I got to get through this and I remember <laughs> I stopped reading right there and I read that thing like that paragraph like three more times I was like wow he <laughs> nailed it yeah. yeah yeah anyway that's my recommendation that's okay. the more serious one super great all right thank you guys so much for this conversation it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you and the show rolling. Um, there is a new way to support us financially. Um, if you are interested, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. The long story short is Anchor was not treating our s- supporters very well um, with some technical issues. You can still support us there. It still works. But we also now have the Patreon, which some people find easier to use. And if you're already on Patreon for other reasons, it puts us all on the same page there. Like I said, though, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion still works also. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us a message. Halting towards Zion at gmail.com is our email address. And that is the best way to get a hold of us. We don't check our Facebook messages. <laughs> we are on YouTube and Rumble and your favorite podcast catcher. Look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>